This week, I spent time with Canadian filmmaker Ryan Mullins, who spent a whole year focusing his lens on the man known to be Ghana's most notorious investigative journalist, Anas Arimiyao Anas. In this edition, Mullins talks to me about how the project came together, hanging around someone who gets regular death threats and the logistics of capturing on film a man who keeps his identity hidden. But first, I will be talking to celebrated award-winning Tanzanian journalist Samuel Awami, who has been on a mission to fight against female genital mutilation in his country. After his fellowship at the University of Toronto, he returns to his country with renewed commitment. We would also talk about democracy and press freedom in his country while he reveals his African dream. Celebrated Tanzanian journalist Samuel Awami, welcome to my program. Thank you so much for having me. How's life so far for you in Toronto? It's great. Uh, I'm enjoying this place. Toronto is such a, a great city. Was uh, it your first time coming to this part of the world? Or? Yes. It's my first time in North America, mm. uh, first time in, in Canada. So I've had a lot of experiences that I've never had before. I can imagine. Yeah. And um, I'm actually inspired by where you actually come from in yeah. Tanzania yeah. as part of the Tabora people, yeah. one of the laid back communities. Mm. How did you shoot up to where you are today? So it's, it's actually uh, a, a series of, of different, you know, events and, and you know, and life uh, steps that uh, everybody takes. But I was born and grew up, as you said, in, in Tabora, mm -hmm. and uh, I did all my schools there, uh, like primary and secondary school. But when I finished my high school, uh, I moved from that city and go to, to a different city, which is about 200 k kilometers from, from the capital, D Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. And so I moved to this city, which is called Morogoro, <laughs> and I worked there for about two years as I was saving my money to, to, to go for uh, for my college. I was actually at the Nights for Right 2014 yeah. Nights for Right when you told the world about mm -hmm. that particular story yeah. that actually of course motivated your people yeah. you know to push you to where you are yeah. and um, for the benefit of my viewers I would want you to share this particular story because mm -hmm. really it's an inspiring one the fact that yeah. you have not just come to Canada yeah. to study the fact that you also influence people back home. Mm -hmm. When I moved from, from Tabora, uh, the region where I, I grew up and went to school, I moved to Morogoro. And I lived in these mountains, uh, Uluguru Mountains, mm -hmm. where uh, most of the people there are, are from the same tribe, like the Uluguru people. And so their sense of culture and practice and tradition are very strong. And one of the uh, uh, cultural practices is, is uh, female genital mutilation and, and dances, as they say. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a circumcision of women and then, you know, kind of introducing them to the world and say, like, this woman uh, is, is mature, like this girl is mature, like she's ready for marriage. They circumcise you. Yeah, so they circumcise the girls wow. and then, you know, eventually the, most of these girls end up uh, being married while they're still uh, like children, like at a very young age. So I lived there as an outsider. I observed and see all these cultures and it just broke my heart because most of these girls were still very young. Like some of them were just, you know, 13 and 14. And they are already introduced to all these culture practices, mm -hmm. which personally, I love culture. I mean, I, I, I love everything about culture. I mean, I, I, I cherish it. I want culture to be but preserved. But not that kind of culture it. that is against the rights of other exactly. people. But when culture actually, you know, goes beyond human rights uh, basics, that's something that uh, I thought there's something wrong here. So I looked at it and then slowly I started following it up and realized there are so many girls who just, uh, you know, finish primary schools and then getting circumcised and go on. But later, I realized actually the problem is bigger than, than just this small community. Mm -hmm. I realized even the, 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 the people from my own tribe, like from my own culture, are also circumcising. And then when I followed up the stories, I realized even some of my relatives, like young girls, who yeah, they've all, they all have been, uh, you know, circumcised. Are these human like rights abuses that you're talking right now? Yeah. FGM is really mm -hmm. um, not new to many African communities. Yeah, I can yeah. talk about my country, Ghana, yeah. for example, especially in the north, mm -hmm. where females, you know, are circumcised yeah. as part of a traditional kind of thing. Yeah. But let's talk about government intervention, mm -hmm. with specific interest to Tanzania. Yeah. Do you think that your government is doing enough mm -hmm. to fight against these human rights abuses? So the thing is, 
my country, uh, you know, illegalized all these things. They, they say this is something that has to be stopped. Legalized. Illegalized. illegalized. Yeah, illegalized. So, so we have laws that forbid these practices. We have laws that say, you know, all this violence against children should stop. The girls have to be in schools. And the government, when you look at papers, you, you, you see the government is doing something. But then the law enforcers, you're talking about police or all these people who can take these issues to, to, you know, to, to, to organs, institutions that can enforce these laws. Are, restricted. are the same people actually who are coming from these same uh, uh, cultures who, wow. like, they support that. So you have, for example, police who are from these villages. They believe in those, in those practices and see nothing wrong about it. There's no way they can take these culprits or perpetrators and take them to law. So the government is strict in these things. We have laws that forbids them. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, w there are cases, actually, uh, people, you know, being t t taken to, to police and, and courts. But the pace that all these things have been, you know, taken care of and addressed is not satisfactory. And really. do these things stop you from telling the stories? Do they block you? Does it serve as a frustration? to you and the many other journalists in Tanzania who are fighting against these human rights abuses? So the good thing is there is a room actually for journalists to, to, to talk about these things and, 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 you know, tell the world about it. For example, my newspaper. Um, the Citizen. Yes, the, the, the Citizen. The Citizen has done such a tremendous job to prioritize all these stories uh, relating to human rights. I've, I've written numerous stories about uh, female circumcision. And my, my paper has actually very very supportive about this. We've had special reports basically about, uh, you know, uh, female genital mutilations that my paper has fired. So for journalists, I've seen quite a number of journalists who are, uh, you, know, you know, telling all these stories and, and, and media, like my newspaper, as I mm -hmm. say, has been very uh, helpful in, mm -hmm. you know, raising all these issues out there. And in saying so, you've been a journalist for eight years. Yeah, Let's talk about much. press freedom in Tanzania. Yeah. How free is the press in Tanzania? Oh, we, we still have a long way to go. A long way to yeah. go. We have old laws which are very brutal to, to journalists. We have the Newspaper Act uh, in, of 1970s which basically gives the Minister of Information mm. all the power to ban the newspaper whenever he thinks or sees like it's, it's it violating, you know, whatever it is. Whatever they, the, the Minister thinks that the paper is doing wrong, he can ban it. The minister has been giving those powers. Yes, the minister has been g giving all those powers. And even the sister paper of uh, my newspaper that I'm working, which is uh, the biggest Swahili newspaper in my country, yeah, has been the victim. But there are other, you know, investigative uh, papers, very vocal uh, newspapers mm. that have been, you know, banned indefinitely. There are all these laws that are restricting and just making journalism to be so hard. I mean, just a few weeks ago, uh, two or three weeks ago, there was a statistics a bill that mm. was, was uh, going on in the parliament. And he basically says the only place that you can get official data is from, from the National Bureau of Statistics. That's the only place that you can get. And so if you get any data which are wrong or are not from this source, you're risking uh, three million, 10 million uh, shillings wow. as a fine or three years in jail. Wow. Now think about the bureaucracy that you can have from getting all this data from the government. But at the same time... And, and, and this is controlled by the government. This is controlled by the government. So you're having all these laws and bills that are basically making journalism being so hard. I mean, it's so, so difficult. And we've had cases of, of journalists being attacked, mm -hmm. you know, gauge their eyes or, you know, some of, some of, one of the journalists was killed and mm -hmm. others just, uh, you know, uh, having all this you know, beaten up and having all this time just because of what they're doing as journalists. But there are those journalists like yourself mm -hmm. who, are not be, who are not deterred mm -hmm. by what people are doing and what the government or any of those institutions are doing to clamp down on journalism. Let's okay. talk about democracy in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Has democracy really come to stay? I remember your last election that saw President mm -hmm. uh, Kikweta as president of Tanzania and I, I thought that, well, mm -hmm you know, comparing it to a lot of the elections that you have in many of these African countries. Mm -hmm. I think Tanzania is gradually becoming one of Africa's success stories mm -hmm. when it comes to election. I can compare that to the very last election that was held in mm -hmm. Nigeria that saw um, President Buhari as president of mm -hmm. that country. Just like many other, other countries in the continent and elsewhere, uh, there, of course, there are still 
some improvement that needs to be done in the whole process of, of democracy. But of course, when you talk about election, uh, our president is not even thinking about extending his, 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 term, you know, his time. So obviously, we have the term limits, and, and so far, uh, our leaders have been very good at uh, respecting those terms. But of course, we have some other challenges, especially from, uh, you know, opposition part have always been uh, uh, talking about you know having an independent and credible uh, electoral electoral, electoral commissions you know uh, uh, the the voting system itself um, we are having uh, this system which is very easy for for one party or the other to mani manipulate or rig all these votes and and all those things the registration of voters so there are all these you know small small uh, uh, you Loopholes. know improvements that yeah. needs to, to, to be done but again in the wider context because democracy is not just uh, voting and and you know uh, leadership transition there are so many other 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 uh, things that needs to be improved like how 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 much you know freedom and and you know and comfortable other opposition parties feel in participating in the whole process of political system so yeah how much uh, uh, you know citizen are involved in all this political system so it's not just about voting and, and going to the polls but also like the wider uh, space and ground for for other opposition Some other one individuals yeah if you want to see anything changed in mm -hmm. your country Tanzania what would it be there are a lot of things. <laughs> there are a lot of things that, that I, I still want to see. But as I said, one of the things that is very close to my heart is, is human rights, of course. Like when, when we start caring about human rights, and, and I think it will be one of the, one of the starting points that would change everything. Today, like at this time, we're speaking about albinos being, being killed yeah. just because of, of how they are. I mean, all these things. We are, we are talking about FGM at this country. Like, girls who needs to be in schools uh, school dropouts they're, yeah they're, they're, they're going to be married off at a very young age and all this democracy and all these things we're talking about rights human rights uh, political participation education the you know right to life and, and, and right to making choices and all these things so I would say there are a lot of things that I would want to, to, to see uh, you know rights are to, to freedom of expression mm -hmm. and all these things so I would want to see human rights uh, uh, one of the uh, like uh, one of the biggest thing that needs to be you know taken care of like immediately as as, as soon as possible. Yeah. And you're going to go back to Tanzania pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. After studying for a year mm -hmm. in Canada yeah. at the University of Toronto. Yeah. What is it that you are taking to your country yeah. with you? What would the changes be? Yeah. I was How like would Tanzanians know that well Samuel Awami <laughs> is back home <laughs> with a big change? The truth is, I now feel so indebted, especially after having this award, um, because to to most people, this award is is the you know celebration of the great things that a journalist mm -hmm. has done, which is is true. I mean, uh, people that I'm I'm sharing with uh, this award who are in the same program, and the people who, journalists who have done such incredible jobs. Sometimes I feel so overwhelmed, you know, being around them. But for me, this award has been more, of, you know, just putting all this debt in, in, in my heart and say, well, now I have even a greater job. I have to live up to this, you know, to this award that I have. So I would definitely continue, you know, uh, writing and, 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 you know, making the voices of, of uh, you know, the voiceless being heard. Uh, as I, I said before, uh, rights of uh, albino people with albinism, you know, rights of, uh, of young girls, uh, rights to, you know, freedom of expression and all these things. So I'll continue to be to work as hard as I can as a journalist and just mm. playing my part as a journalist to uh, and make once in a while better place. you pay a visit to Canada. I hope because so. Because it's actually becoming your second <laughs> home. Uh, I, I wouldn't I say speak to, I speak to a number of the people yeah. you, you, you are in school with and they're excited about yeah. your achievement and what you've done and yeah. uh, the aspirations that you have for the future yeah. and all that. And I'm sure one day we're definitely going to see Samuel Awami as the number one journalist all over the world? I, I really hope so. I mean, I, I've, I've had a great time here in Toronto. I would definitely have to come back. Uh, I've met lots of friends here. But yeah. I'm telling people there are a lot of opportunities in Africa that, you know, it's, there are a lot of things to talk about. There are a lot of things to work on. And the, the beauty about it is that when you do something, you see change like right away. When you write a story about all these girls who uh, were in circumcision or you write stories about albinism, mm. And laws are being changed. I mean, you see changes instantly happening, and that just gives me so much satisfaction. Mm. So, 
there are a lot of opportunities, but also rooms, you know, to, to see the change. When you talk about something, something happens, like, right and, away. And with this question that I keep asking my guests before they leave the scene, yeah. there's always the, you know, the African dream. There's yeah. always the Canadian dream or the yeah. American dream. Yeah. What is your African dream? Wow, that's, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big question. What is uh, your dream for the continent of Africa one day? Well, it's a, it's a big question, but <laughs> I think the, the, my African dream would be to see the Africa that Africans are excited to, 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 to leave and just mm. be proud of, of their identity and the proud of their place. This is the kind of Africa that I dream of. Africa that people would be happy. The girls would feel safe, you know, to run around. The girls would be, will feel hopeful that when they finish primary school, they don't have to, to worry about being married off or not knowing even know what they're up to. But they're, they're, they're excited about going to secondary school to go, you know, to university and to pursue their dream. The Africa that, you know, uh, uh, people are not discriminated because of whoever they are in terms of, you know, sexual orientation, you know, uh, the color of their skin or anything like that. Africa that everybody is excited to live in, you know, when, when we come to North America. <laughs> you uh, want to go back yeah, to Africa. Yeah, we want to go back home yeah. and, you know, cause all this change. So this is the kind of Africa that I want to see. It's happening slowly, but it is happening. And I'm very excited about it. And it, it takes journalists like yourself and yeah. myself to yeah. keep telling the That's stories right. of Africa. That's right. To bring about the change. Samona right. Wami, yeah. thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Yeah. Next, Canadian filmmaker Ryan Mullen spent a whole year focusing his lens on the man known to be Ghana's most notorious investigative journalist in the film Chameleon. We'll also talk about how the project came together and what he feels about Anasa's style of reporting. Okay, uh, you prepare a hidden camera for me. journalists like Anas who, who risked his life to report the truth. Anas is a big name in our country. But when journalists begin to play James Bond, it's troubling. Now from the second paragraph we move to the neck of the story. And the neck must be nothing but the facts. <laughs> Shit! Now what you see here is me in disguise. What you see here is me dressed as a sheikh. What you see here is me disguised as a rock. Journalism is a weapon. It's an asset. It's a means to an end. I'm in handcuffs with him right now. <laughs> yes, we are in handcuffs. <laughs> Exciting. So Ryan Mullins, director, Chameleon, is my guest. Ryan, welcome to my program. Thank you for having me. Interesting name, Chameleon. Why Chameleon? Well, Anas is the Chameleon, right? He disguises himself in so many different ways, and we just felt that, do we really know who he is? And so, can we get to the bottom of that? And, um, you know, it, it incorporated a lot of the, the mystery and the, the illusion of this kind of superhero and uh, we felt it was actually quite fitting for the film. When first did you hear about Anas Arimiya Anas? So uh, I studied journalism in Montreal. Mm. and uh, You're based in Montreal. I'm based in Montreal, yeah. And um, in 2008, I had the opportunity to travel to Ghana to work and live there in, uh, in the Volta region. This is where I made my first short film, Volta. Mm. It was about a, a derelict cinema in, uh, in Hohwe. And um, so I was there for quite a while and I made uh, some good friends there and then I returned to Montreal. But I was always looking for a reason to kind of come back and make another film there. And so we kept in touch, the friend of mine. And one day she sent me this article in the Atlantic magazine. It was called Smuggler, Forger, Writer, Spy. An incredible article and it told the story of an ass. You know, this James Bond of journalism. And so uh, immediately I knew this had to be my next story. But how do I get to him? How do I make contact? And luckily, this friend of ours was a mutual friend. Mm. And so she brokered that, that initial deed, um, contact. And so you flew straight to Accra 
Well, you know, at first, you have to speak to the person. Yeah. So. How was his initial response like when you spoke to him at first? I mean, that you wanted to do a documentary on him, and his response was what? Yes, come do the documentary? You know, I, it was amazing, because I, I imagined that he would be very reserved, and he wasn't. He was actually open to the idea. The way that I had pitched the documentary was that we were going to get more of a behind-the-scenes look at, at his work. And, you know, he had done great work with Al Jazeera and CNN in the past, and these were, you know, features covering specific issues. But I wanted to do kind of an all-encompassing look at the work that goes on, the teamwork, the strategizing, the setbacks, and all that, and really get kind of an in-depth look at, you know, the challenges that, that he faces as a journalist. And so I think Anas uh, gravitated towards that idea. And, you know, he, he may have had his reservations at the beginning, but he was also very kind of open to the, to the process. And you are going to see somebody stay with the person investigates more with a person, somebody who's received several death threats. Mm. You are not scared going to be with somebody like that. I guess I should have been, but uh, you know, at the time it was just, I was wrapped up in the excitement. Um, you know, I think Anas takes his precautions and I felt comfortable and safe under his umbrella and working with him. And so, um, you know, we n I never felt that my life was in danger, but at the same time, you know, it was important that uh, not just for myself, but to protect Anas and to kind of frame him and make sure that he felt comfortable in the way that he was presented because he doesn't hide his, uh, or he hides his face and he doesn't show his identity on camera. He never trusted you with his face? Oh, I saw his face, <laughs> but, you know. You did? I did, yeah. Wow. It's quite interesting how things went, and I happen to have been at the premiere in Toronto, um, here in Toronto, um, and I... I'm going to speak to Anas Aremiel, Anas myself, in the next episode of my report. But there are some reservations that I got in the documentary itself, which I want to, I want to ask you about. Especially, mm -hmm. did you find some grey areas in his style of reporting as a journalist, ethically? Well, I think, you know, um, I'm, I was certainly conflicted perhaps with, with some of the... Uh, the styles that he used, but I think that's also what makes him an interesting character, and that's what drew me to him. He wasn't just, it wasn't just white and black. There were gray areas, and I think, you know, he also recognized those gray areas that he crossed, and he'll say that, you know, whatever, whatever means necessary he needs to take to get the ends that justify the means, he'll go to those, those ends. And so, you know, that, that really just made, drew me in and made me want to follow him because it would add more depth, I think, to, mm. to kind of the portrait of what a journalist kind of goes through and the gears that, that they, that, you know, they work in their minds. And your documentary captured one of Ghana's seasoned journalists, senior journalists, as people may call him, Kwesi Prats, mm -hmm. who, for example, thinks that the style Anas is using to report is very unethical in the code and the conduct of the Ghana Journalist Association, as, as he may put it. What do you think about that? Well, I think that, uh, you know, certainly Kwesi Pratt uh, does raise an interesting point. Um, you know, our journalists supposed to be using uh, deception, um, you know, disguises, uh, hiding their identity. Subterfuge, uh, as you call it. Subterfuge, correct. And I think that, um, you know, there are many tools at a journalist's disposal, and you just have to see what, what is necessary to kind of get to the bottom of the story. Here in Toronto, you know, uh, or in the West, we're, we're not... Uh, you know, we have used uh, these things, hidden cameras, in the past to, to get at stories. You look at, you know, the biggest story of, of the past year, which was the, the Rob Ford scandal, uh, the, the mayor caught smoking crack mm. cocaine. Mm -hmm. This was all hidden camera and subterfuge journalism, you know. So I think that um, we can't stand in the West and say that, well, this is, this is how journalism is supposed to work. I think that, uh, you know, you just have to look at a cultural context. Let's also talk about the Mazar of Mintukwa, something you captured quite fairly and well. And I was quite surprised to know that the police, after leaving, you know, that particular village, bent down the homes of, you know, those they had arrested. What's your take on that? Were you impressed with that? Because your documentary captured it quite vividly. Mm -hmm. No, of course, I mean, that was, that was a difficult moment for me because, that, you know, things got very, I mean, for me, they seemed to get, out of control. But at the same time, I was also happy to be there for that moment because, at least for me in the documentary, 
had it been just all one-sided, just kind of a, a version of Anas's work that was, you know, um, showing this, this hero, I think that it would have seemed superficial, mm -hmm. the documentary. But, you know, we were able to show kind of when things don't go necessarily as planned or when things uh, kind of fall apart. And I think that was important to show that, you know, these things do happen. It's real life. And, you know, the, it wasn't staged. This, this, as much as the film emulates a fiction style, this is actually very true and, and true to reality. How many cities are premiering this movie before Accra? Well, we've already premiered in, uh, in Amsterdam. That was our world premiere at uh, the... Uh, in Amsterdam? Yeah, at, at IDFA, which is the uh, International Documentary Film Festival in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. um, in February, we played in Mexico, which had in a great, res great response. Um, of course, journalism and, uh, and the, the safety of journalists is very important in Mexico City. Our Canadian premiere, our North American premiere, has been in Toronto, Canada, mm -hmm. and the response has been fantastic. I saw, I saw it. I, I was part of the, the people there. After the documentary, one woman walked to me, straight to me, and said, look, this kind of journalism is new to us in Africa. This is a kind of journalism that our people here, you know, tell about the African continent. Now we have Africans telling their own story. You're impressed with that? I am, and I think Anas is an empowering figure in that regard. You know, uh, I think he makes a strong point at the end of the film is that now journalists, Ghanaian journalists, African journalists are telling their own stories. And for me, you know, um, Kwesi Pratt reminds us that I'm not necessarily going to get all the facets of what's going on coming from the outside. Of course, an outsider's perspective is important, but you really do need someone with, with you know, a perspective from the ground who's, who, who's grown up in Africa, who's an African, I think, telling African stories. Ryan Mullins is my guest today, director of Chameleon. In the documentary, Ryan, you had a conversation with Anas's father, and he was very open to you in the fact that he cares for the life of his son. Who is Anas really when he's not doing his work and job? Well, as far as that's concerned, I can't go into too many details. But for me as a documentary filmmaker, the question was always, how do I make this film without being able to show someone's face, your main character's face? Because so much is told through the face and through the eyes, right? So I had to relearn on how to make a documentary. And so how are we going to tell this story? And so we needed to find people that surrounded Anas, you know, his teammates, um, his colleagues, his father, to kind of tell his story and give us a human face because we were never going to see him. Luckily, Anas is charismatic enough, I think, to carry the weight of the, the film just through his voice alone and through his actions. But, uh, you know, that was something that we, that we considered pretty... Uh, and you pretty never heavy. see nothing wrong with exposing Anas's father well, in the so public domain? His face was not covered? His face wasn't covered, and it's something that we discussed. A number of his staff were also, mm -hmm. sure. like, open in camera? Yeah. With your face is not covered, you, you're not, you don't think this is a security breach in a documentary like this? Well, it's something that Anas and I discussed at length. You know, we came to an agreement on who could be shown and who couldn't be shown. So you have to think of Anas's team as two types, two camps. Mm -hmm. And so there is his production team, his news team, his producers, who we were allowed to show. And then there was his investigative team, who we weren't allowed to show. And so that's something that we came to an agreement on. And when is um, Canadian showing in Accra? Do you have an idea? Well, we're hoping uh, soon enough. Next few weeks, I don't want to make any promises. Um, we will let you know, and it will be, uh, it will be there, definitely. We are not in the States for time.